the tragedy and the uncertainty of unfolding world events highlight how fortunate we are to have this annual experience of retreat. And retreat gives us a chance to experience a deeper recognition of our truer self and maybe get glimpses of the compassion and the love that we're capable of. It gives us a chance to recognize some of the false conceptions that we have about ourselves, the fears and hopes and uh, anxieties that we carry, and give us a chance to drop them. Uh, in retreat, we have the opportunity to challenge those false concepts and watch them crumble uh, in the presence of deeper recognition of who we are and who we aren't, actually. Um, and at least for a short while, the mind is free of self-limited prisons that we create for ourselves. The mind becomes less defended, more sensitive, more open, allowing more humility, I find, and uh, more love, more compassion, uh, more wisdom to be more accessible. I know all of us here feel such gratitude for our abbess who founded the abbey and has created these incredible conditions for us Westerners to be able to do retreat. These are conditions she didn't have as a young nun, so thank you. And I know we feel deep gratitude for all those who sponsor us to be able to do annual retreat, and so deep bows to all our sponsors. So here in retreat, we're doing five sessions a day, and some sessions may feel like we've become a super sattva. <laughs> Um, you know, where we maybe we feel like we've conquered a particular affliction that'll never come back again. Do you have that feeling? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Or maybe you feel like you've made great strides in developing compassion or cultivating insight into the 12 links. And then we hear, <laughs> and then we come back to the real world. <laughs> How many of you remember the movie Avatar? Yeah, the younger people will know this. You know how uh, Jake would get in his little pod and close the door and he'd match up with his Avatar body and then he'd go and do these superhuman things that he couldn't do as a human. That's how I often feel in retreat. <laughs> Meditation allows us to touch places in ourselves that we don't normally access in daily life. So although the heightened awarenesses of these insights will inevitably fade, sorry to break it to you, especially those in Vajrasattva retreat, <laughs> um, the memory of these experiences stay with us and we carry them with us. And although maybe they're not as strong, not as vivid as they once were, they inform how we uh, engage in our daily life. They give us a touchstone to remember what we're capable, capable of and what we can um, try to aspire for in our, in our daily practice. Retreat also gives us a process to, um, gives us a chance to process and reassess old memories. Any of you doing any of that? <laughs> um, for example, one session I re-experienced my mother's death in living technicolor. I hadn't planned on it. I don't know what triggered it. Uh, it just presented itself as something that needed attention and um, complete with, um, before my mother died, several years ago actually, she told me which dress she wanted to be buried in and which shoes. <laughs> so that, that, that part was already taken care of, but I had this very vivid, vivid image that after a year, probably what was laying in her casket was this beautiful black dress and a skeleton. So sometimes those kind of realities can hit home in a very deeper way in this sensitive space of retreat. So meditation experiences can feel so vivid, so mind-altering in the moment that to attempt to share them is pretty much impossible. But because I don't yet have day and night of mind unceasingly aspiring for liberation, um, in addition to bodhicitta, I've spent most of this retreat meditating on, uh, focusing on the teachings of volume three, true dukkha, true causes, origins of dukkha, and also the 12 links, trying to strengthen um, a genuine sense of uh, renunciation, determination to be free. I know that this determination to be free is an essential part of developing bodhicitta. And rather than leaving bodhicitta at a very superficial level, we need these deep experiences of, of renunciation. So true dukkha and true origins of dukkha are topics that we must come back to again and again. And uh, although we may feel reluctant to, as Venerable mentioned a couple Thursdays ago, for many reasons, we're reluctant to come back to meditating, really plumbing the depths of true, true suffering, true dukkha. Um, I've shared this story before, but uh, I'm going to bring it up again. Maybe 10, 15 years ago when I lived in Australia, I met a woman from Bhutan. 
And um, she was from a Buddhist family. She grew up in a Buddhist culture. And she was probably in her 40s. She'd come to Brisbane to do graduate work in education. And in the course of our conversation, she mentioned to me that um, she made every effort to live her life according to the Four Noble Truths. And there was such a sincerity, such a depth to how she said it that immediately my mind thought, oh yeah, I do that too, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> and I knew, no, I'm, I'm nowhere near doing that to the level that she's doing it. And so over the years, um, this has been kind of a mantra for me to come back to, like really aspiring, wanting to live my life with that kind of depth and knowing, knowing that there are layers and layers and layers of the Four Noble Truths to uh, discover. And so in this retreat, I've spent some time going through the different lists um, you know, the eight, the six, the three, and um, making examples of them in my life where I could. Um, and a pattern, a new pattern began to stand out to me that I hadn't seen before. And that is that I hadn't recognized as clearly that each of these lists describing true dukkha highlights birth controlled by karma and mental afflictions. Um, it, yeah, and this ties in nicely with the, the 12 links so, for example, in the list of the eight sufferings of human beings, Tsongkhapa's Lam Rim Chimo spells out five different points for each of the eight. And um, they're, I find these very juicy to go through and think about. So, for example, with birth, birth is uh, suffering or dukkha because it's associated with pain. Um, childbirth is painful for most of the beings in the, in the six realms. Um, Birth is suffering or dukkha because it's the cause of suffering. Um, as soon as we're born, there's aging. In the next moment, there's uh, illness, uh, death to expected, meeting what we don't want, uh, not getting what we want, etc. And um, birth is the um, birth is suffering because it's the origin of suffering. You know, as soon as we we know from our studies with the twelve links that as soon as there is name and form and the six faculties begin to develop, we become experiencers. And that means that we have contact, we have feeling. And as soon as there's feeling, have you noticed? <laughs> pleasant feelings, there's attachment immediately without any thought on our part. Uh, often when there's unpleasant feelings and there's aversion, and off we're running, creating new uh, links, new 12 links, uh, constantly, all day long. But the one that really got my attention here is birth is suffering because it's associated with the dysfunctional tendencies. and um, I thought about this a lot. I really appreciated Geshe Sopa's commentary. It's very helpful in unpacking this a bit more. Dysfunctional tendencies here refers to the potentials that we carry with us even at the moment of birth, actually even at the moment of conception. We come in with a backpack full of dysfunctional tendencies. <laughs> there we go. Um, to, to what? To experience uh, undesirable circumstances. In other words, when we take rebirth and cyclic existence, we're all, we already possess the causes and conditions for unpleasant experiences right there the first moment, moment that we come in. In fact, we carry these negative tendencies. Um, the fact that we carry these negative tendencies means that even at the moment of birth, we are at the mercy of our karmic seeds and afflictions. How do you feel about that? Even though we're hardwired to want happiness, to avoid suffering, um, we are limited due to these dysfunctional tendencies. In other words, we're screwed. <laughs> you might say, you might be thinking, wait a minute, that's not true. I'm a Buddhist. I know how to purify my mind. I can uh, accumulate merit. Um, I know the causes of happiness and suffering. And I would say, yeah, that's true to a certain degree. But how many years were you at the mercy of your dysfunctional tendencies before you met the Dharma? And even since meeting the Dharma, how many of you are still at the mercy? How many of us are still at the mercy of our afflictions? Watch your mind the next time we get donuts or someone criticizes you. And what about the other 8 billion human beings on the planet? What about them? Thinking about the Russians, the Ukrainians, they're at the mercy of their karma and dysfunctional tendencies, aren't they? So the Buddha's analogy of the turtle servicing once every 100 years and putting its neck through a ring that's tossed about on the surface of the ocean is not hyperbole. <laughs> and these lines from the three principal aspects of the path are not exaggeration, swept by the current of the four powerful rivers. 
tied by the strong bonds of karma, which are so hard to undo. Remember the meditations Geshe Dottle led on this? Caught in the iron net of self-grasping e egoism, completely enveloped in the darkness of ignorance, born and reborn in cyclic existence, unceasingly tormented by the three sufferings. Now, luckily, it doesn't stop there. It goes on to give us some antidotes. <laughs> By thinking of all mother sentient beings in, the, in this condition, generate the supreme altruistic intention. Our very birth is the product of afflictions and is conducive to more afflictions. Can you see? We are a self-perpetuating machine. Do you know that about yourself? Can you see that? As we've, seen in the, as we've seen in the 12 links, the karma that produces our individual and collective experiences is all an outgrowth of the afflictions. It's more compatible with the class of afflictions than with the class of wisdom. That means that once we take rebirth in samsara, possessing the negative tendencies, our aspirations to attain happiness through virtuous actions will meet with all kinds of obstacles. Have you noticed that in retreat? Uh, anyone here had single-pointed concentration in every session? Probably not. So even though we might want to dedicate ourselves to the spiritual path, we can only do so much because we don't have full control over ourselves. That's the sad truth. We are under the power of previous karma and afflictions and are limited even by the environment that we live in. For example, how many of us still find ourselves cleaning up dramas and traumas from our childhood? That is time not spent on bodhicitta. So the external world we live in, the planets, the mountains, uh, the rain, the, the snow, and the internal world, our body and our mind, these are all consequences of karma that we have created beginninglessly since the beginning of time, all driven by negative tendencies. And that means we have created our own experience by our previous karma, and now the world channels or limits our behavior. It limits what we can do with this life. No wonder Spiritual practice can feel glacial at times. Have you noticed? <laughs> so we lack freedom and self-control to do whatever we wish. Otherwise, we'd have spontaneous bodhicitta already. So in the more open, vulnerable, sensitive states of retreat, this kind of uh, reflection sets our alarm bells. You know, like, let's do something here. Let's get serious. Let's go deeper with this. Um, there is something else we can do. And it can offer us a new sense of humility and determination. Humility reminds us of the enormity of the task of this karmic backpack that we're carrying with us. It's no small task. You know, it feels like it when we first meet the Dharma. Oh, a couple weeks I'll have this knocked out. Um, these are lifetimes after lifetimes, aren't they? And also, awareness of this is it's not just my situation but it's the situation of all sentient beings. And so this determination to bring about full awakening for the benefit of all beings becomes renewed. Um, just quickly, in the description of the three types of suffering, there's an analogy of the wound. You know, when there's an open wound, we pour um, salt water on it, it becomes painful. That's the suffering or the dukkha of pain. Um, if we pour cool water on it, it's the, it's the, um, it becomes reduced. The pain becomes reduced. It's the suffering of change. You know, for a short time, we have relief. But there's a gaping wound all the time. This is maybe the part we don't understand. And we have a gaping wound. Why? Because we are associated with these dysfunctional tendencies. Also, in the six uh, types of suffering in, in, the, in all of samsara, you know, there's this one about repeatedly taking rebirth, again, due to dysfunctional tendencies. So... To develop renunciation or the determination to be free of cyclic existence, we must understand that taking rebirth without control under the power of ignorance and formative actions is the problem. Of course, the larger problem is ignorance. But unless we begin to recognize this, we won't have the energy to try to overcome it, to reverse the 12 links. As one great sage said, although we have entered a constantly blazing fire, with problems, poverty, hardship, and acquiring food and shelter, effort and keeping and finally loss, as well as separation, illness, and aging, we boast of happiness. This seems insane. That doesn't land for most of the 8 billion people on the planet. They don't have a clue about that. We have the opportunity to discover that in deeper and deeper ways in our meditation. 
So are we really screwed? Of course not. <laughs> the entire law and rim is our antidote tool, tool, toolkit, right? Um, so, but we have to make effort on our, our, on our own. So we have our work cut out for us. I hope you're enjoying your retreat.